everyone that's listening to the Pops Season 2 podcast. Welcome to our episode, our guest co-hosted episode. My name is Karen Pitcher Christensen and I'm Julie Ferris Tillman. And we are here today working on our topic or kicking around our topic, which episode title is COVID positive, the power of public speaking skills in the post pandemic world. And we are happy to have this opportunity to contribute to this season of podcasting. So I'll start off with a very quick introduction. Julie will introduce ourselves and we'll kind of not only introduce ourselves briefly, but also kind of briefly explain the path that led us to this moment of of doing our own podcast. Um, As I noted, I am a full-time faculty member at Des Moines Area Community College in Des Moines, Iowa, and have, uh, prior to that, was at a small liberal arts college. So I've been teaching public speaking in some form um, now for over 15 years and continue to do so. Um, And Julie? I um, am a former faculty member at the University of Alabama in Huntsville and have been teaching adjunct at Carroll University in Waukesha and Marquette University here in Milwaukee. I leapt from academia into the professional world in marketing, advertising, and public relations, yet I still teach a version of public speaking because um, I teach students about branding, interviewing, um, and understanding more presentational style communication needs of our marketplace and our industry. Yeah, so Julie and I are, well, we go back a long way <laughs> because <laughs> of, of, we are our friends and colleagues um, knowing each other from our time pursuing our respective doctoral degrees at the University of Iowa um, and over the years have collaborated on different things. But just in our kind of social casual conversation over the course of the pandemic. We've had a couple uh, happy hour, Zoom happy hour kinds of things. And it just was funny because we were in our casual conversation. We're talking about how the pandemic has made us like really think about our public speaking skills and teaching public speaking and, and how those are playing out both in the classroom and in the professional context that Julie works in. And lo and behold, uh, not long after that conversation was this opportunity to uh, contribute as guest uh, co-host to a podcast on these types of topics. And so um, since we have a secret dream, not so secret, I guess, anymore, that <laughs> to have our own podcast <laughs> of some variety, um, Julie and I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity because we were just talking about these things in our, in our lives anyway. And so we are happy to have the chance to kind of kick it around Um, I think we offer up, or I would argue that we offer up kind of a nice bookend of of the experience, right? I'm I'm teaching, I'm full-time teaching, you know, on the ground, so to speak, or in the classroom or in the interwebs, wherever it's happening, right, right now. Um, But I'm teaching, you know, freshmen and sophomores in college, kind of in the beginning of their public speaking education in a lot of cases. And while Julie's certainly in the classroom, even though in the classroom, you kind of offer up the other bookend too, because, because I mean, most of the classes you're teaching these days are later, like juniors and seniors, correct? Yeah, I'm helping people put a bow on their degree. So where they may have started with basic public speaking, comm theory, media studies, I've, I've taught all that. But now at the end, Marquette offers this really great course. I think it's great because I teach it. I've taught it for years now. Um, that I call how to get a jabby job, but I think technically it's called special topics and advertising. And <laughs> <laughs> but we basically wrap up everything and help them understand that communication theory translates like understanding your audience, finding common ground, that those presentation skills that you, you know, manufactured for a, an informative speech that now your informative speech is a job interview. Now your persuasive speech is pitching a campaign idea. And so I translate their core learnings into launching them and getting them into the professional sector um, with those skills intact, using those skills as a lever to to propel them. Mm -hmm. And so that, I mean, you're doing that in your 
um, kind of your side gig, so to speak. I mean, you have plenty of teaching experience and continue that experience, but then, but then you are on the other end, I guess the other bookend, oh. right. <laughs> of you are sitting in the professional world in a way that is, is different than being in the classroom. And can you talk just a little bit about what you're doing for your position and, and who you work with and what types of things you're doing at work? Yeah, I'm the director of public relations for a mid-sized advertising agency here in Milwaukee. And obviously in advertising, we typically have clients all across the country. So the idea of a conference call is normal. We just commented the other day that, you know, go to meeting and WebEx are now just a thing of the past. We use them to call in clients to a speaker phone in the center of a conference room and five people would huddle around and stare at the phone. I mean, we didn't even often share screens even with PowerPoint slides because we have the client watch on their own computer. And now the pivot to being always on screen to actually physically meeting with people in cyberspace was immediate. And, and so we've been at it about 15 months, but even the first week that my agency went fully remote, we were learning how to cascade screens, how to look at people. Our CEO even mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm trying to watch people's expressions, see how they respond to information. And our clients are doing that too. We've been recording video for clients for social media where we need short video and we're learning how to edit. Um, people are learning how to speak they're going back to presentation basics. Instead of just opening a meeting and saying, hey, how are we getting started? There's a great intro to help cue that we've started, that everybody can hear. We wait for the internet lag and then we proceed, right? There's so many jokes. You're still on mute. Can you see my slides? Are you in here, Karen? Wait, it says she's mm -hmm. connecting. So it, we're in a weird way, we're back to square one there's a lot of pressure because there was an in-between time where maybe we weren't at our best because we were just on the phone, or maybe we weren't at our best because we were sending a lot of written messages. But, but now that we're in this space, everybody has kind of changed their persona and changed what they deliver and how they deliver to accommodate the fact that we're on again. We are on again. Yeah, I think that the, you know, and these are the types of things that we were casually talking about before we even, you know, conceptualize this podcast. And while I think there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely a lot of, I mean, there's definitely for everyone, right, this pivot, and I really like that word of the idea of the, the pivot that happened, right, you know, 15 months ago or whatever, is, uh, you know, caused a lot of, of heartache and stress and, and, and some scramble in a lot of cases for a lot of people. Now that we've had time to let that dust settle a little bit, though, I mean, I think the thing that we kind of come back to is that, you know, wow, talk about a situation in which uh, our public speaking skills sort of are more important than ever. And I think what is, and so not to say that there aren't some negatives, but I mean, in terms of public speaking education, I think COVID has brought kind of a lot of positive, like teaching moments, even with some of the losses that we had in terms of things like giving live public presentations to live people in the same space. Um, it's really brought up a whole other set of skill sets. And I think that going for, and this is something we might kick around some more too. I mean, you know, we're not, I mean, the work, particularly in the world of work, although I think education too is fundamentally changed and will go forward as fundamentally different in lots of ways. But I think in the world of work, I think we're really going to see, you know, what does this look like when people, you know, maybe we ever reach herd immunity or people are back in offices and things like that. I think that a lot of these things, we will keep a lot of these things from the pandemic in our future work and teaching lives. And so that's what I think will be, um, I think all the more important to kind of really maybe break down, like what, what do we hang on to from the lessons learned in the last year plus? Yeah, I, I kind of want to ask that because in your classroom space, you are so up close with so many different students at the, you know, core public speaking instruction. It's a little like algebra, you know, I think many people fear public speaking. They, they take the class because they have to. They maybe don't look forward to it. And then there's that line, like, when am I ever going to use this again? I, re I remember when I was teaching it, we 
continued to say, like, if you ever want to go to a city council meeting and take the mic and offer your opinion on, you know, there are lots of times in your life where you need to be a strong speaker. Well, you know, for teachers of public speaking, today's your day, right? We, we are relearning. Professionals who've been working for 30 years are relearning how to focus or make eye contact because they have to find the camera. So maybe a question for you, Karen, is... Um, do you kind of feel a little more empowered even in your digital classroom space to, to remind students like this is an algebra you need. You need it now more than ever. What extra skills or what extra behaviors do you point out to them and say, see, this is going to pay off? Yeah, I think that the. I think. I got to think about what I want to how I want to start this. I think that the ultimate. Okay, I think that the challenge for any teacher of public speaking, and you know this too, because you've taught, you know, like you said, is that idea that when students go into it, they see it as that, you know, not, you know, check mark requirement. You know, I'll get knock it out. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll give some other presentations in my other classes. But I mean, I'm not going to be a salesperson or a teacher, or I'm not going to be somebody who's up and I'm not going to be a politician. You know, they're so limited so often. And I think it's certainly a great exercise. And I've always done this in my speaking classes to really like brainstorm. I mean, it's one of the things I usually do the first couple of days of class is brainstorm. Like, when in your life are you going to have to talk to other people eventually? You know, <laughs> and we make that list, you know, and they start to realize like, oh yeah, like whether it's social situations, like a toast at a wedding or whether it's, um, you know, maybe you're a trainer, right? Teaching a group of people at your particular job, blah, blah, blah. I think that what really, there's a lot of <laughs> leverage now for, like you said, what was once maybe just a conference call where no one is visible, um, or just, uh, you know, yes, you work in an office and maybe you're not giving big speeches in front of big groups, but you meet in small groups or whatnot. Now, all of a sudden, right, those things, if they do go virtual to the Zoom mode or whatever, you know, there is that visible camera on you. And like you said, like relearning some of these really basic skills of, and I think to be honest, like a lot of people, I don't think prior to this time had the skills of things like looking at the camera. That is a newer thing. And that is something that even I still like am working on reminding myself, like, where is the camera? Where should I be looking when I give my speech? And I always really praised my students this year that could find the camera well for their speeches, because that was something that wasn't an obvious option and something that's new for most people, right? We're used to the idea of like, give your audience eye contact, but the eye contact, quote unquote, through the camera. Um, I think that the the biggest takeaway for me in terms of like a te like teaching moments coming out of moving is like that idea of the attention to context when you are that speaker you know when you're giving the speeches so let me say really quickly i have only taught public speaking in in person or in a like a web blended situation where we would do some online work but our speeches were given in the classroom in that scenario, so obviously folks who have taught online have probably thought and talked more about this, but for my students, right, they had to make that immediate pivot of, no, the context for your speech is not the classroom anymore. The background is not the whiteboard anymore. It is back to, you know, thinking about it's not just you as as person and how you dress and how you look, which is a whole thing too, I think when you're doing things from Zoom and people made that realization really quickly of like, oh, whoa, I look like this on camera, I better make some adjustments. But that context of all the things now have to be controlled by you. What is your background? What is going on behind you? Um, that could be distracting to audience members or even just very basic tech things like your lighting, your sound. And those are things that were absolutely not necessary in a public speaking context in a normal, quote unquote, normal face-to-face -face classroom setting that all of a sudden, and it wasn't even just, I could help them, but it's still kind of on them, right? And it was so interesting because so many of them, I the background thing just like cracked me up and also was a great teaching tool, right? Of like, because they could see it from the other students speaking. You know, it's like, it's hard to take someone seriously in their speaking when they have a Bud Light poster 
you know, <laughs> up behind them, or even just something simple. Like you have a ceiling fan that's running while you're talking and yeah. that shadow is really irritating and you may not even notice it, but like we do, and it's taking away from your message. Um, yeah, I want to, I want to bring that up. I think that's happening in the professional world too, Karen. And it ties to something I, I want to talk about a little bit if, if, and when we return to the world, um, about how to be audience members. You know, when I teach public speaking, there's two things at stake. I do spend time, well, there's more than two things. <laughs> I spend time talking to our, our class, you know, about how to be a good audience member. And I, I have always used this example of the be in a room and how what we're all looking for is great communication. We all want to hear the message. And have you ever been in a classroom where a wasp or a bee gets in and no one does anything about it, but everyone's paying attention to it? We're all watching it bounce against the glass. We're listening to it buzz. You see people swaying in their seats to stay away from it. And I always encourage my classes, in the interest of great communication, point it to that distraction and remove it. Don't tolerate it. You know, someone stand up and say, let me get the bee or let me open the window and put a pause on this, what's happening and clear away the distractions. And as you talk about students needing to understand context, that's the same lesson. The bee in the room is your Bud Light poster behind you or understanding what you're presenting. I have a client who we talk with um, on Zoom calls or Google Meet calls, and she has a connection issue of some sort between her headphones and her computer. And when she unmutes herself, the, the noise that her computer fan creates for everyone on the call sounds like a motorcycle revving in her driveway. At first we thought it was a lawnmower, you know, but then seasonally as times changed, we realized it was her computer because no one would be mowing their lawn in the snow. And yet she doesn't hear it, we do. And it's been a real experience watching, you know, teams of maybe 10 people handle the bee in the room, handle that distraction. People will say, oh, I hear another motorcycle. Hold on, let me, let me try to talk over it. Because we know it's her, but no one wants to say to this person, fix your headphones, something's wrong with your computer. And I think she in kind of a face-saving move, maybe realizes it's her and then goes back on mute. But everyone on our team has found a way to kind of point to the bee in the room and shift communication so we can still hear one another, we can still receive the input and the information, but that we can modify against this distracting piece of context. So that has been kind of the most basic of skills that how are we as audience members? How do we raise the expectation for communication we point out when people are fuzzy. We point out when we can't hear them. We all kind of have the patience to drive good communication. And that's been an awesome learning. Now, how do we take that back to our physical bodies when we get in a room again together? How do we help people not fidget and, and give focus to the speaker? How do we help people physically be good audiences in the old way again? Because we've gotten very good at being good audiences digitally. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess maybe the question, the question back to you would be, um, have you noticed that? Have you noticed that your students listening has shifted or changed? I think that, I think that given our particular context, which we used, uh, our class sessions were done through Blackboard Collaborate, which is our school's LMS system. And to be honest, the, I, I was very difficult, if not impossible to have all students visible in a gallery all the time. I had to modify and have just a small number of students, like a select group, you know, any given day would be the on-camera audience. And of course that's all, but that it brings its own thing too, right? Cause like you said, you have to think about the, you as audience member, it's kind of also hard to, you know, you're, you're the students speaking. Sometimes I look at the audience members, they'd be like lounging on their beds and, you know, do, or maybe muted and eating or something like that. Things that were really different in the classroom than, than you would have in the classroom. I mean, in the classroom you had so, like, it's so strange, right? Because in the classroom, the context, the setting, the environment is very, in a lot of cases, 
pretty predictable. You still have those maybe tech snafu moments, but you know the space you're speaking in, you know the people to whom you're speaking, you know where they're going to be sitting, et cetera, et cetera. So you could say that's sort of easier. But on the other hand, you could argue too that like there is so much more control factors going into your live presentations as well. And of course, I'm talking about the idea of like a virtual live speech, which is how my speeches were conducted this school year for the most part. And so you have so much control, though, over things like, you know, making sure your own technology works effectively, making sure you know what's going on, testing that camera, looking at the background and things like that. You know, people, I always think, too, people who have softer sort of voices or for whom projection is difficult probably, you know, got off nicely with the virtual setting because people could adjust their computer volumes if they had a hard time hearing, you know, like those types of skills were harder to teach and harder to reinforce in the virtual setting than they would be in a live setting. But here's the thing is like for everything that we maybe lost, right, from having the live physical face-to-face -face speeches, you bring in a whole other set skill set Right. Once you, you you went virtual and that's that's really valuable, too. I mean, and having that control, too, because like you don't you know, student doesn't get to control what is behind them, per se, when giving a classroom speech. I mean, maybe they have slides or something. Sure. But like they, they know that predictable environment. It really puts that onus back on them when it's back in their personal space. And also thinking about, and I also saw students kind of use this creatively, you know, too. So, you know, I had a student that was able to, uh, gave, she gave her persuasive speech. I think it was something about how, you know, all restrooms should be all gender restrooms. And she had a rainbow flag as her background behind her. And like, that was just a lovely, subtle, yet not subtle <laughs> sort of, I mean, she didn't really reference, she didn't really reference it in the speech, but it was a nice backdrop for her topic, right? So she worked that to her advantage and students definitely noticed it in the feedback and that sort of thing too. So um, I think that the, the, it just brings up this whole other kind of, yeah, in the context too of like, again, how do you act as an audience member? How do you act as an audience member online? Um, you know, the other thing that was fun and different as well was like the, the role of chat um, in terms of giving oh, feedback to, you know, to speakers. Actually, that I, I really do want to talk about that. That has been two, two major faux pas have occurred in the professional space that I would love to translate back to the classroom. And that is, um, you know, the way you engage your audience, the pressure is on to make your communication compelling because everyone is multitasking. We uh, and you can see it in their face. So as a speaker, mm -hmm. it's really hard because you see people's eyes either moving to their bigger computer screen if they're a two screen user, or you see their wrists and hands and hear them and you know that they're emailing you. It's, it's like when women put on mascara and their mouth hangs open. Like you know, <laughs> are emailing or on another screen based on what their face is. And so as a speaker, that's nerve wracking. I know you're only half listening. So now I have mm -hmm. to either respond or I have to have structured my comments to be persuasive and compelling, which is, you know, at the core of great speaking. But the chat is just a whole nother beast where it could be an amazing tool. Like I remember persuasive speeches in my class where students open with, how many of you have gone on a nature hike, show of hands, or, you know, those sort of informal polls, like now technology allows us to actually be polls. Technology allows us to actually be feedback. There's a cool way to work that in. But when you're delivering important information, let me give you a download on what's happening on this project. Let me give you the directions you need to move something forward. And someone is throwing up chats like, oh, here's something similar. Oh, here's another bit. People listening who are trying to give you focus keep turning to catch the chat notification. So when you are a, in a classroom and you are the single speaker, the, the 15 people watching you know to stay quiet till the end. And digitally, the, the five people watching you may stay quiet, but chatting is not the equivalent of being quiet, it's actually a huge disruption. We've had a couple mm -hmm. of colleagues who are bad at it and, and have actually, you know, in meetings been reprimanded and said, can you hold the chat till the end? Like it's mm -hmm. just everyone from this very important set of directions or 
is very important download of information. So it, that's, that's been a huge sort of skill challenge is how we've all been working so hard to be multitaskers that suddenly to be good speakers and good audience members again, we have to somehow pull back you know, and, and pull back into singular focus. And as a speaker preparing your argument, you have to recognize that you are not going to get singular focus. So how do you choose the organizational structure of your speech? How do you choose to use evidence? Because it has to be better than ever to, to hold focus. I actually, when you mentioned, you know, people's backgrounds and, and um, kind of how they do that what it takes to make a, a good presentation now and, and what surrounds them, the context that they control. It's another observation that I've had that I think is, is COVID positive. It's kicked older generations in the, in the butt. Um, mm. private. Karen, you and I were Gen Xers. We're private. You know, work is work nine to five school is school. I, you know, we teach public speaking students, the element of pathos, if you want to give a speech on organ donation, a personal story about how it affected you is going to be persuasive. But that's about as personal as we tend to get. We we don't tend to tell people all of the other things in our lives. And, you know, research out there says this millennial generation, which, by the way, senior millennials are now turning 40. So let's be careful about how old we think millennials are. But when they were on trend, we talked about how millennials were very revealing, were very personal, that they intermingled their work and their life. You know, they they would come to work and instead of talking water cooler talk, like a TV show they'd watch, they'd tell you about their last therapy session. You didn't need to know they were in therapy. You didn't need to know that, but, but they felt comfortable weaving their personal and their public together. And so that's fine. We were having a hard time grappling with that as a worker in the workplace right? Your, your younger work colleague who is very open and expressive. Now we've seen everything. By, by dialing into meetings, I know what color my colleague has painted her dining room. I know um, what kind of pets they have when they bark and yell. I know what their deck looks like. I know their chosen artwork. And I'm here to tell you, I love looking. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't think I don't lean in to see that painting. Don't think I don't lean in to see the artwork on your fridge, depending on where you sat. And I did an interview with a woman who I hired, but in the interview, her, her son didn't know she was on an interview and he popped into the room and was like, I need the printer. And, you know, all of <laughs> you watch newscasters have their children emerge. Yes. Weathermen trying to use green screens and their dogs jumping up. We are now intimate. Yes. And I think that not only does that change you as an audience member, not only does that change you as a speaker, I think much, I think it's the part of this COVID positive. What emerges from that is a whole new catalog of persuasive tactics. Mm -hmm. you know, I always struggled. I'm a pathos person. You know, I'm an ethos person. I want a credible speaker who can, who can give me anecdotes and experiential stories that help me to believe Logo, I, I love I love the detail of data and statistics, but, but they aren't the most persuasive things to me as a listener. Now, sort of the can of worms that is pathos, that is that common ground uh, that, you know, Aristotle always asks us for, that's available. I can now see inside your house, mm -hmm. and if I really want to get you on this project, if I really want to persuade you, I can now reference dogs, because now I know you have one. I have mm -hmm. all additional insights to bring you into my audience or to structure my persuasion that wasn't available before. I mean, this is definitely a positive outcome of the world that we've been living in. How have your students reacted to each other's personal spaces or how have your students capitalized on knowing more about each other when they're being persuasive? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I'll, I'll get to that. I think as we're talking, I mean, what was really coming into focus, I think, is just the idea that like the, the, the relationship, I mean, I think going virtual or the pivot to virtual in all the different forms, whether it's in the workplace or in the classroom, is the relationship between speaker and audience is what has been redefined. And certain things I think definitely are easier, right? So the students who are like, my dream has come true. Like I'm taking speech in college, but it's all virtual. I don't even have to go to the classroom. You know, it's like, like we talked about, it's like, it's not necessarily 
I don't think it's easier or harder. I think it's just different because there's there, there's certain for every easy thing that is made maybe a little less you know intimidating because you're not in that live classroom. There's another element of intimidation, which is like you know, will my technology work and and can I be heard clearly or am I yeah? How do I love your point about how do you compete with the multitasking? Like that is something you know when you really think about a traditional public speaking classroom, those variables are so controlled. You know, yes, a student might try to multitask during a student another student's speech, but they'll know I'm, they know I'm watching, right? They know that they have a job to do, which is fill out their feedback forms that I use in class and not read the, read their phones or read a newspaper or do homework for another class, right? They, they know they shouldn't be doing that multitasking and typically do not, right? Where in this case, because, you know, we're all working within a small frame and, and, you know, the surveillance is completely out the window in some ways, um, as a teacher, the, the, you know, it's like, there's a different onus now on the speaker and there's a different onus to some extent on the audience member too. Um, I think one of the things that was an absolute joy in teaching public speaking in a virtual format this year from home was the students, like I, I gave that one example, but like um, students got very creative and really enjoyed the idea of the uh, like the how to assignment that I always do. So we had how to's many how to's that looked kind of like a cooking show. And you could tell the ones who had really thought this through and really took advantage of being able to literally use their stovetop and, uh, you know, employing maybe tactics of the shows that they really like to watch just for fun, right? <laughs> um, in terms of making an omelet or whatever it was they were <laughs> making. Um, I had another student I had people do things where they took, uh, they were uh, out in their garage working on cars and showing things from their vehicles or from a car engine, uh, literally showing the dipstick of how to change that oil, you know, really taking advantage of things that would have been very difficult to do, and if not impossible to do in a classroom. And one other example of that, um, that talk in the category of impossible to do in a normal setting, but possible in the realm of the virtual was I had a student whose who's public speaking topic or for her how to topic, uh, the speech was how to shoot a gun properly. And she had kind of established that ethos of in her introductory speech that her family was into shooting. She lived in the country and she took us outside and did a great job. I mean, really approached it as, you know, it may look like anyone could just pick up a gun and know what to do. And, and like, there's a protocol and there's a way to stand and there's a way to hold it. And it was very interesting. And the students just, I mean, whether, you know, it wasn't about gun control or gun no. rights or anything like that, but it literally was, I mean, again, in that category of like, I know I could not do this in a normal uh, on yeah. campus classroom, yeah. but I'm going to take this skill that I very much know how to do and showcase it. And she did a tremendous job on the speech. And so those have been like the really fun, unexpected joys of, of the change of scenario. And I think that you can almost kind of see too, like, you know, maybe on a day, right, where someone else is speaking that same day, you realize you could almost see it in their faces, the students that are like, I had an opportunity here to do something in a different type of environment and I didn't take it. And I really think that a lot of them kind of could feel that conscious, like, man, I could have done something more interesting or creative here. Um, and, and they didn't take that opportunity. But what a great moment. I mean, they, they, then they still captured opportunity because the minute the light bulb went on in their brain and they saw, they still learned it, right? They, they still kind of cataloged that for a next time in their life. So that's super cool. You know, when you talk about content and you're talking about this opportunity to do a speech about shooting, which, you know, clearly she could not have done that speech on campus, right? Mm -hmm. There are other rules in place. I, I think that there's something else great coming out of this pandemic. And you mentioned this, and, and I wonder if you want to talk about content. There is subject matter in front of us that is unbelievably filled with opportunity. I agree. I think that COVID, 
you know, it'll be interesting to see now another in the fall semester, next spring semester, but I, I don't, COVID created inadvertently a wonderful sort of case study, or I guess maybe a topic area, right, that works so well for public speaking in terms of, of students really, like, you want to you wanna hang your hat on a persuasive topic idea. I mean, COVID offered so many options that were so great in the sense that, you know, when you're getting students to really think about, okay, you have to do a persuasive topic and it should be relevant to the audience and something that, you know, ideally, you know, impacts everybody or could feasibly impact everyone. And yes, there are topics like that, right? Whether it's climate change or, or things like um, uh, voting and voting rights, which are certainly important, relevant topics. COVID-19 is like, talk about a topic that is instantly relatable to everybody. It impacted everyone's lives in some form. Everyone deals with it right now and continues to deal with it on a relatively regular basis, whether it's the, am I wearing a mask in this store or not? Am I getting vaccinated or not? Can I travel or not? What's a vaccine passport? Do I need one, et cetera? I mean, in terms of like a persuasive topic bank, um, there were some really great speeches that came out of it too, because it was that type of thing that offered up, I mean, it, it's a public issue, it's relevant, it's tangible in everybody's everyday lives. Um, things like, uh, and then you also get into, okay, well, what arguments are you making and what sources are you pulling on? There's so much misinformation about the pandemic that, you know, sifting through that and being able to craft a persuasive speech, say, about why you should get vaccinated, you know, really pointing out that, like, okay, this stuff you may be hearing is not accurate, or look at who, look at these sources and what they are saying about the safety of vaccines and things like that are, are really, really important. And so I think that, you know, obviously things are, are going to continue to evolve and to change, but it offers, it's still, you know, in the future, I think, right, whether it's, we're still talking about things like masking and distancing in the classroom. I mean, I don't even know what our fall classroom might look like in terms of, I know we, we're not social distancing, but, you know, are we going to need to wear masks even as vaccinated young adults on campus um, in terms of, you know, what will happen you know, potentially with the idea of vaccine passports or requiring vaccines, whether that's for school or for workplace, right? Employers requiring vaccines, um, all those types of things, you know, still offer up some some really relevant stuff. And it, and I think that it, I mean, in that regard, right? I think that students were very smart in a lot of cases to, and I didn't see tons of the exact same speech, but you know, there's lots of little angles that students could find to make a really compelling sort of con, you know, compelling content because it is so relatable in a very obvious way to most students. And I think, you know, like, well, um, I know we've chatted about this idea too. I mean, just that idea of showing students the ability to, to deal with the pivot, to deal with a change. And I mean, that's something I think you were talking about or you've seen when it comes to things like, particularly your seniors that are getting ready to graduate and how do you tee that up to them? How can yeah. they make COVID kind of work for them, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it's content for them as well. Uh, among the things that we do in our classroom, you know, is I think I, I, I think I did this as a public speaking instructor too, but for this class, we go through a mock interview situation as well, where they interview. Um, and then they also hear from recruiters and prospective employers in the class. And we spend a lot of the time kind of manipulating their resume and talking about how they present themselves. And we run through sample interview questions. We talk about what an interviewer may be trying to find out and how to answer that, how to, how to look knowledgeable, how to present yourself with ethos. And now this has been two semesters because it's a spring course and mm -hmm. we're two years into it now. So in both semesters, I told my students and, and you could see a light bulb go on with them. They have content no one else has. They have survived a moment of change management. And in today's industry, that's a priority because workplaces, not just because of COVID, but certainly that exacerbated it, workplaces are changing constantly. They are recreating their culture. They are recreating their uh, supply chain. They are recreating how they deliver service how they market themselves. And so one of the key things that many students will get asked as they move into, especially in advertising, public relations, communication industries, 
you know, is how adaptable they are. How can you change when a deadline shifts suddenly? How good are you at changing when the whole thing is canceled? Or how good are you at changing when you get to an event that you were creating and your talent doesn't show up? I mean, it's very relevant. And so I was explaining to our students and, and I saw them capture this as they practice their interviews is you all have an answer to that question. It's, it is a hard question for a 22 year old. It is a hard question for a 45 year old when you say, how do you handle change? Mm-hmm. Because you have to have been tested by change to know an answer to that. And right now, right in front of them is just a bushel of answer. My classes went online and I had to immediately learn this. Some students commented that I'm very extroverted. I do way better when I hear other people's questions in class, when we have discussion in class, and that's not happening in some of my online classes. We had faculty in the first semester who were so unfamiliar with online instruction, they just dumped a bunch of readings into a shared portal and said, you know, I'll I'll see you at finals. And my students were complaining about that. I, I just, suddenly I don't get this instruction that I was learning how to manage. Now I'm an independent scholar waiting for an exam. And so they all have hot and ready examples of here's how I handled change. Here's the thing that the piano that dropped on my head and how I had to get out of it or how I had to get through it. They all have multiple answers to that now. No other of my graduating classes had that handed to them. That was not something I could create for them in the classroom. And so one of the one of the positive things about the content of COVID is in addition to being persuasive about vaccines, in addition to understanding source material and research and which voices have power and ethos and how you support or align your argument with them. The the other side of that coin is how do you make example of the moment personal? And for yourself, I, we have all mastered change. Let me let me go one level further in my analysis of this and say this caused change, that caused change, and I navigated it in the following ways. So that has actually to me been really fun and rewarding. I and I think the students who are very upset. You know, Marquette students didn't get an in-person graduation last year. I had, Mm -hmm. I'm teaching teachers who partway through their semester would break down in tears and say, the last eight weeks of my favorite moment of life that I was ever looking forward to has been diminished. It was so great to kind of say to them, you have something no one else has. Mm -hmm. You have this opportunity to manage change. And so it has been great content, really Mm -hmm. great. I think that the... I guess my question for you would be going forward. I mean, none of us, you know, I think we're getting a clearer picture of what both classroom, you know, education as well as the workplace will kind of start to look like, although we can't predict what, you know, spring of 2022 will look like, right? But what would you say would be as, you know, faculty going into, say, the summer or, or the fall semester, you know, with a modified, probably more back in the classroom sorts of things. I mean, if you are doing something either real-time virtual or a blend, what sort of skills do you think we should kind of maintain from this weird year, I guess you could say? And, and what would be helpful going forward, thinking about how the workplace is going to probably adjust and change? Um, what what do we want to keep? What do we want to extend? What do we want to continue? I think one of the most important things that we've adapted and is going to stay with us is the ability to share so much more information at once. And so as Mm. someone presenting, thinking about it's exactly the pivot we made when we moved to online. When, when I taught web writing, telling a singular story, but thinking about the key moments in the story where you could link to more. Where would you take someone? Would you take them off screen? What warranted a link? Because you couldn't make every word in your story. You could technically make every word in your online feature story a link, but you don't want to do that for certain reasons. So even though there is a plethora of opportunity now to bring in multimedia resources Um, and evidence, how do you choose what that is? Picture a conference room in a traditional advertising setting where you may be pitching a new client. 
the habit for that for years has been a PowerPoint deck. Right? Mm-hmm. Look at my amazing slides. Look at the ideas that we have test driven, even in kind of a Mad Men type moment, you know, it's, it's boards on an easel and well-written speeches that drive us to feel passion for the image that's about to follow, drive us to feel about the ad and the concept. Well, now as I report to clients, not only do I reconsider, I have always stood, I, a mentor very early on in my professional career said, you never pitch an idea sitting down ever, Mm. no matter the shape or the nature of the room, stand up and sell an idea. So now we've been sitting this entire time. How will we stand in a room again, be able to just, you know, quite literally the nuts and bolts of it, gesture to a large screen that holds our PowerPoint, turn and make eye contact with a camera that's capturing us, the conference room, the PowerPoint, and, and, you know, beaming it back to a client in another location and capture the back and forth between people. Can we move from that PowerPoint and link out to other websites? Can we add multimedia in the sense of sound and, and clicking quickly to video? That's always been a problem. Tell me the last time you were in a meeting where someone's like, oh, hold on, let me pull up a different screen to get the video in. And is it working? And I think the smoothness and the polish of being able to move from this visual center idea to this kind of eye contact to this kind of turning focus and direction to to inserting this extra piece of digital evidence, that ability to juggle all of those balls is is going to be essential because I don't think that we will go back to a far more basic way of presenting. Now that we've opened Pandora's box of all of the, the ease of multiple tools and examples, it will be very hard to go you know, when we haven't gone back to using poster board in a very long time since we mm-hmm. had that. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that the skills that students are going to need most is the ability to think maybe three-dimensionally. Not only do my words mm-hmm. need to build to evidence and have a source citation, not only does my body need to sort of rhetorically and non-verbally sell the idea, but now I also have to think about other trajectories. Do I project this image? Do I go to this website? Do I share this clip? Do I look at this whole audience and broadcast? Do I record myself doing part of my speech and add it to Mm -hmm. my live speech? So Mm -hmm. I think they need to think three-dimensionally about these tools. I really like that idea, the idea of the like (laughs) three-dimension. And you're right. I mean, there's so many options in this format that it would be a shame, I think, to walk away from them if you are in the position of going back to the classroom full time, which I essentially am going back to the more traditional setup. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about going forward in terms of my public speaking classroom is, you know, probably hanging on to some sort of virtual delivery, whether it's a recorded speech, which of course are done often in fully online classes and things like that. That in itself, I think is a very valuable experience of the full recording. Can you re-record, taking advantage of being able to re-record, maybe even include editing. Usually I didn't in my assignments, but, but like you said, and now as you're, as, as you were saying that, it makes me think, you know, maybe instead of a recording, I will do a, 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 one of my speeches, even with the regular classroom, do virtual sessions for one round, because it really does get into that space then of, oh, I can, am I going to do a share screen for this section? Am I going to show slides here? Am I going to do this live from my kitchen? Or, you know, I mean, in literally three dimensions, as you were saying that too, I think of how more effective so many literal three-dimensional props and things were in this setup. They were easier for a lot of students to deal with if they didn't have the tech know-how to do the fancy slides or whatever. A lot of them did a really great job with kind of immediate props that they could easily have from home or a setting at home where they could, you know, film themselves kind of make, you know, it's much more interesting to watch someone, for example, like cook an omelet live on their stove and talk through that process than looking at slides about it or just listening to someone talk and hold up a frying pan, you know? So 
I mean, thinking about maybe keeping at least, at least for some element of it, right. Keeping that element of, of, you know, cause I, I think that, you know, I am no, I mean, I work in education, you're in the, in, in the professional world, but I, I think it'll be fascinating. I keep reading things about like what is going to the next office phase is going to look like. And yeah. I think that students anytime in the next few years, if they're entering, you know, more professional settings, whether, uh, I mean, or even just in school settings, right. It's going to see, it might be modified. It may not be as extreme as the last year has been where everything has been virtual, but I don't think it's going away fully. And I think that the more that we embrace that as a skill to be taught and celebrated, right. Right, is a skill that you know congratulations like you can give a fantastic virtual presentation or you know how to effectively get your point across even within a short meeting you know and i think that's the thing to come back to too is that you know as long as we have zoom meetings even your informal meetups with your coworkers are um you know or what you what maybe would be perceived as not a public speaking scenario if you were in an office and casually meeting in the meeting room now in the virtual meeting room right i mean it is a public speaking sort of situation where the camera is on you and you've got to think through how you're going to communicate and you've got to think through how to reach the people that are trying to multitask all the things that we've been talking about um I think there's going to be great stuff going forward in terms of really reinforcing the very real world applications of public speaking skills, kind of in general, and then also yeah. the very real world applications of now, not only is like, these are basics for public speaking to a crowd in a classroom, but the public speaking concepts going forward into all kinds of quote unquote, real world, <laughs> as the students like to say, right, real world scenarios. Um, it's great. And, and I think that we're at kind of um, an exciting moment with public speaking education, because we can work on those things. I, I agree. I think to your point about content as well, the, the classroom is also going to look filled with more variety. Uh, I don't, not to be insensitive, but when I was teaching, one of the common conversations we had in the, in the break room of Eastern Illinois University was, you're going to get somebody with a blood donation speech. You're going to get somebody with an organ donation speech that these were the standard persuasive mm -hmm. moments that an 18 year old was discovering or that, a, you know, a student was newly discovering. Now we've been global. I mean, think of the concerts, the museum tours, the lectures mm -hmm. at different universities that have been available to us. All we've had to do in this past year is understand time zones. But <laughs> I am... I am on the phone with Jakarta in the evenings for a project. Now, as an advertiser, I've certainly worked in global and international advertising projects, but, you know, it was a phone call through WebEx. Now we are global and we are understanding broadband capabilities. We are understanding language. Being able to watch my English as second language colleagues has led to so much more understanding than trying to just listen on the phone. Like watching mm. them speak has made it so much clearer. And the ability to recognize international and global concerns, knowing the differences in the kinds of commercial activity happening in Mexico, understanding the rise of TikTok in Indonesia. These are all content fodder as well. And I think what's going to happen is our public speaking classrooms, because of so much exploration of content, things to talk about in order to practice these skills, I think that there's a giant opportunity for us to be a little um, more worldly, a, a little more aware. There, there are going, there's going to be a blossoming of kinds of topics and things that people can share because there's just, there was always access, but but I don't think we all chose it because it was cumbersome. It was you know either a phone call or it was reading only online, but video production, video sharing all of Zoom, Google Chat, et cetera, that have emerged at rapid speed in the last year have now put all of this access in our muscle memory, where before we knew we could get to those things, but it would be hard. Now mm. it's just as a click away to tour a museum in France. It is, it is a click away to take a class um, at an Austrian university that's being offered at 8 p.m. So I think that we are going to see much more worldly conversations in our classrooms too, because the subject matter can be 
pulled or gleaned from anywhere. So mm-hmm. I think spring, so I guess maybe I'll, I'll ask you too, like spring of 2022, the, the finals week next year, what do you think you will have seen? What will you be wrapping up in your post COVID positive COVID aftermath? Hopefully it's an aftermath by May of 2022. What kinds of things will, will you be wrapping up? Well, I think that, I think my argument would be that presumably and hopefully going forward with the sort of lessons, right, of the last school year into a new school year and we'll say post-pandemic world, I think that there'll be, (laughs) I guess, those lessons in terms of a couple things. One, in terms of audience, right, reminding ourselves of like what to do as an in-person audience might take a little bit more adjustment, um, reframing or forcing ourselves to sort of slow down and not be the multitaskers and, and not have, you know, thinking too about how do we want to interact now? We don't have the chat function. We don't have the ability to do emojis as a nifty way of, of conveying feelings or information to back to the speakers. Um, those interpersonal kinds of elements, right, will will come back and hopefully be refreshed again in the classroom. I think that, I really think that probably my selling point for the folks coming up in the next year is because I really want to work hard as a faculty member to make sure that students are in a position of feeling comfortable across contexts. Um, it would be my kind of end goal, right? Like, not only do I hope you, you know, yes, you took my class and you came to classes and in the classroom and you can deliver speeches to your peers, but also thinking of what I can incorporate into my classroom that makes students feel comfortable that, you know, we don't, we don't know, right, what the future might hold in terms of new outbreaks of, you know, a different strand of the pandemic, or maybe even a God forbid, I hate even saying that loud, right? (laughs) That, you know, what would happen if something like this happened again? Or what happens if you, you know, your employer decides like, okay, we're never going back to live face-to-face. We're just going to do things remote. Um, That I think that it's our duty in a lot of ways to try to prepare students the best we can to, okay, you know, here's the things you have to recognize when you're doing your public speaking to a live physical audience. And here's the things you have to recognize in this virtual kind of platform. And it may, I don't think it's necessarily even double the work. I think it's a matter of just taking like where, what, what things are similar and what things are different and incorporating them into the teaching of those skills. And then, you know, probably incorporating some sort of virtual assignment, even for those of us that are face-to-face um, to really practice those skills some more and, and, and point out that like, you know, this is where, kind of like you said, this is where younger people, or I should say those that are back in college and, you know, faced with these kinds of experiences or forced into a lot of cases, these kinds of contexts, this is where you do have the advantage, right? Because like you kind of, you said at the very beginning of our conversation, you know, the, it's the, it's the 50, it's 60 year olds that all of a sudden are like, wait, what? What? Oh yeah. I need to remember to look at the camera or, you know, that they're, they're not as fresh in those skills. And so, you know, see it as, it's really something to, to build up and, and uh, work towards the students get ready to move on to the next phase, whether that's graduation or moving on, or in my case, moving on to a four-year university um, or into the workplace context, um, whatever the case, I think that there's skills that are not going to go away anytime soon. Well, don't we sound smart? We do. Um, is there anything else that you want to add about in terms of, of either uh, things that you would urge other faculty or, or uh, uh, teachers or even students that um, in terms of what, what could help them out in terms of going forward in the professional realm? You no, know, briefly, I, I would just say it is algebra. You do need it. Mm-hmm. It, it is it is a skill that, like you just said, isn't going away. We still value and trust the people we talk to. And and a lot of that is influenced by their performance and their polish. Even in, you know, I have back-to-back meetings all day and different people lead those meetings. And their ability to command that audience, 
be clear in the directives for what's about to happen, provide information to speak clearly, to be heard, to that changes everything. So for, I would say, keep doing what, what we're doing because the core foundation of being able to speak to a group of people, whether it's at a podium, you know, one to many, or whether it's in a small group or in a meeting, or even to make your case on, on why work needs to go differently or, or, or uh, a deadline needs to be extended or an idea needs to change. It is going to be a constant part of your life and working in a communication industry profession, because so many public speaking is a general education course that any career professional is going to take on. But especially for those students who are moving through a communication pipeline, it is a, it is a significant expectation. Of, of your day-to-day work, that you can do this, that you can run a meeting, that you can deliver key information, that you can listen and know how to be persuasive and how to add an argument to understand your audience or your client and hear what it is they're after and, and deliver that. It is a significant requirement of the job. So there's there's no threat to the need for public speaking whatsoever, whether it's gone digital or whether it stays in the classroom. It, it's so essential, so essential. I think that's really exciting because I do think that often the case, and this is certainly conversation in the larger discipline, right? Of like, what is the future of public speaking courses and what is the future of you know, public speaking? And I think you, know, you have a strand I think many people have come on board in terms of embracing like the change in formats and and the new opportunities that are available, even if they don't look like what we would conceptualize as, as public speaking. But I will say, I think that it is an exciting time because I think that, you know, there were not a lot of good things that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and but um, in this very strange way, I think that we can probably say that in terms of really reinforcing the power of public speaking and the power of public communication. That is maybe one positive that has come out of this uh, long (laughs) journey of the last year is reinforcing the importance of it, both um, in terms of of things to talk about and teach in the classroom and the things to continue to work on and refine once out in the professional settings. And so I think that, I hope that um, our listeners have found our conversation to be helpful or enlightening or at least Um, encouraging as well as we think about moving into another uh, school year with some new things on the horizon in terms of the pandemic looking and and being different. But um, I want to thank you, Julie, for our our coming, joining me with this co-hosting duties. And as we mentioned before, uh, my name is Dr. Karen Pitcher Christensen. and, And I'm Dr. Julie Ferris Tillman. Yes. And we thank you for your time and thank you for Pops for giving us the opportunity and the platform to discuss these issues on a broader level. And uh, thank you for listening. 